Yeah, it's sort of like giving a tip in advance, you know, the applause before you actually hear me blather on. Um, yeah, so uh, th it was interesting. I was listening to uh, a keynote about, like, you know, this increasing complexity story we're all in and how it's sort of the, the slowly boiled frog of, of how things have become more uh, complex over time and what we do about it. And I think this should, should be interesting um, if folks are interested in, in, like, you know, what do we do now versus what, we, what we've done in the past about similar problems. Um, my name is Adrian. I, I work in Spring Cloud um, uh, at Pivotal. So, um, but I'm focused on distributed tracing, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, I would talk about uh, Zipkin. I, I worked on Zipkin at Twitter and, and um, still do today. Um, and I, I've had DevOps roots. Uh, I uh, once worked on a project called JClouds, which is provisioning and things. So I'm kind of happy with DevOps and stuff. Um, of course, it's not just Tools Fest, which has been a lovely thing to hear people talk about. You know, the, the more important parts, how how we relate. And I think I think this this talk could help with that too. Sometimes getting on the same page is is really the the uh, first step. Like we heard um, in the talk um, before about security is a nice way to collaborate. You know, between different groups and relate. Uh, hopefully, I'll find some ways to to help when we're talking about latency. So. Um, I've renamed this slide a couple times, and this morning I renamed it to Understanding Latency, because understanding is the important part. Latency is sort of like, you know, a context of that. Um, we really want to understand our architectures. So, um, you know, we use this word microservices, and of course we have data pipelines too. Uh, at the end of the day, we have a graph of components that are that are distributed across networks, and you know, as things flow across that graph. Um, they can become delayed or failed um, due to things, right? And um, at the end of the day, when we're trying to operate our architectures, we want to understand what they're doing today in production, um, not necessarily um, historical, although historical stuff gives us context. Uh, so I, I like to start simple. Um, and you know, a lot of times we might be asking ourselves, why is like this post command taking so long? And that could be maybe the server's taking a long time, or the client's taking a long time, or the network's taking a long time. Um, I have longer presentations to dig into like, you know, how analysis works. But let's let's say that there's often at least two sides of the story. Um, for example, uh, we all know the story of like hotel and sometimes conference internet where like our perception is a lot slower than what the server might might perceive because um, there's network in involved. So when we talk about understanding latency, for example, we at least have to know that there's there's two sides of it. So in this case, I've drawn like one line of the critical path according to the client, and then the green one, if you're not colorblind, or the, the, the gray one. Um, is from the server side and what, what that perception is of the same operation. So when a client sends something, you know, the server receives it afterwards. Hopefully it doesn't receive it beforehand or else you have clock skew. Um, but at any rate, the, um, you know, there's perspectives involved. And when we're looking at latency, it's important to know not everything's on the critical path or maybe not everything should be on the critical path. So in this example, Say we did a, an HTTP POST request to some API someplace, and we have a redundant um, operation. We sent it on the wire twice, maybe because there was a network disconnect, or maybe my timeout settings were incorrect. But our bar, the blue long bar at the top, which represents the time that it took to do this the request, is longer because there's um, you know, a redundancy there. And when you, when you look at latency from a point of view like this, it's kind of nice because you can see it's right in your face. Like, OK, well, this, this could have taken less time if we didn't send the, the data twice. Um, but we can also see uh, a latency optimization. I'm sure folks, folks here have like, heard of asynchronous, probably doing things asynchronously. Async means so many things. But let's just say. Um, you let the client go early. And so in this case, if we look at this post command that ended up in a storage operation, the actual storage 
um, uh, went longer. Uh, so the, the server let go back to the client before it had finished writing to disk. So um, most, most storage um, services will have some means of, of um, doing things in the background. And that's, in many cases, to allow your uh, clients to, to have um, you know, uh, more resilience because they don't have to wait or potentially be blocked on those things. But when we're looking at uh, latency, it's never as easy as just, you know, well, I'll tell you how it can be as easy as this. But it's usually not this, this way if you're just collecting information by yourself because there's lots of things that are not relevant that are cluttering your view. So for example, if you're a Java programmer or you have other things that produce like thread dumps, you may see all sorts of junk uh, in there that you have to sift through and, and filter out to understand what's going on right now. Like, you know, maybe reference queue.remove is not really of interest to you and there's other things going on in the virtual machine or the, or the uh, container that may not be relevant to the, the operation. They're, they're contextual within the machine, but they're not necessarily um, causal uh, from a latency point of view. And as a keynote said, like, you know, this is an a, a image I ripped off of Wikipedia. Of course, I didn't really have to because it's so simple. <laughs> could have drawn it myself. Architecture used to be very easy to draw. Uh, you could draw it on your napkin. It's, it's, in many cases, we still have, we still have um, apps like this uh, where, where we have client server architectures. Um, but they're increasingly unrealistic um, because of at least, you know, we're, we're, we're getting to po points where there's multiple shards. Uh, you know, our data services are more complicated. And, and so they don't fully explain latency um, when, when there's more to it. So like a lot of times our architectures really look like this. This is a screen grab off of um, Adrian Cockroft's project called um, Spigo, which, which simulates um, networks. And this is sort of a, a view of what like a Cassandra low balanced architecture looks like. It looks a little different than this, right? Um, it's more realistic. Um, and, and so they're getting harder for us to draw manually. Now we, now we have like fancy D3 and stuff to, to help us visual, visualize us. And we're able to deploy these things because, um, as we've heard about from previous pre presentations, tool chains are getting more integrated, um, automation exists. Um, so we don't really need wizards anymore to deploy uh, increasingly complex architecture. But that doesn't mean we should need those wizards to operate them. Um, so, uh, so sort of like we have this arms race between you know, observability types tools and deployment tools, you want them to both be like, you don't, you don't want one to win really. You want them both to be great. So distributed tracing is, um, you know, a technology area I've been, I've been focused on for a little while. And it's like another thing in, in our tool chain. It's, it's, it's really trying to commoditize knowledge to help us understand things, to rely less on wizards. And this is, um, these systems help collect these graphs of latency um, in near, near real time. Like, so say for example, it might be a second or a minute delayed depending on, on how you configure things. But it's, it's a view of production, a pretty, pretty recent view. And you would be able to, to compare uh, commands to see um, you know, why one might take longer than another. Uh, we're in a mixed crowd. I'll try not to get too jargony, but there is always vocabulary. Like, you know, we invented this word container a while back, right? Um, span is, is uh, one of the jargon in distributed tracing. It's the thing that encloses what took place and any um, notable events um, along the way. And a trace is just a tree of these things. So, uh, for example, in the post things, uh, context, maybe our span name is post things. And we have some context, like which shard it was on, like the Wombats cluster, and this, this uh, IP was its listen address. Um, some tags, which might be lookup keys, or just like information for viewing. And then uh, at least a couple events, um, like this is a server, as opposed to a client. And you know, it's send and received um, you know, during, during that time. And this is, uh, you know, distributed tracing is an observability tool. It does not like replace Splunk or Logstash. It, it augments uh, your, your understanding by, you know, maybe helping you correlate with those tools. But it's not like a replacement for metrics. Um, it, it participates in, in these areas and it's more debug focused. 
um, the system themselves uh, deal with the act of like collecting this information and presenting a, a single view of it and allowing you to query on that data. Unlike a lot of observability tools where retention periods are pretty long, tracing data tends to get pretty big uh, fast and retention uh, is usually days. Like, so for example, Uber system is a two day retention. Uh, Twitter, it was like seven. So um, it's not like, I want to see all traces from last year um, because you probably need a very large data set to do that. And pro tip, it's not just for latency. I actually used to talk much more about latency, but then the real point is understanding. You really want to understand what your apps are doing. Uh, for You can do things like find services are, that are actually not used, but people think they are because they're getting like heartbeat traffic, but it doesn't actually do anything. Um, uh, like for example, if you have all of your requests coming through an edge router, you could actually tell services that are never hit. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, but my favorite part is just reducing the time spent on triage. Um, you know, technical folks like myself can get into like endless debates about hypothetical reasons why something might be taking longer than something else, and we can argue for hours about yes, it's a replication factor issue. No, it's this or that. But if you actually have a real trace in front of you, uh, it sort of ends those like hypothetical discussions. The triage process gets much quicker because you can tell what is uh, going on. So I'll show you Zipkin to put this more concrete. Zipkin is an open source tracing system. Um, and this is a screenshot. Um, sorry you can't see it, but this is a, a client request, uh, which is always the longest line on top. Well, it, it's at least it's usually the longest line. <laughs> um, that's a critical path. And this is a Python Flask server that's received this request. And then it, it looks like it's doing some MySQL commands in, in uh, sequence here. And so you could tell uh, by looking at this what actually happened. So for example, if someone said, no, you know, there was no MySQL delays, you could say, well, there was, yeah, you're right, it was only like half a millisecond. Yeah, we shouldn't focus on that right now. Let's, let's focus on something else. And so it, it's a nice way of, of understanding what, what actually happened. Uh, the service uh, list here, um, ideally uh, works with, with uh, whatever your discovery services are so that they're coherent names, so that um, you have a, a d direct map with, with uh, all of your other tools, and so that you could do a, a query to see, okay, in this operation, you know, this Flask server was involved 10 times. And so these, these type of metadata can help. Uh, Zipkin itself lives in GitHub. Um, it first lived in GitHub in 2012 when t Twitter open sourced it. And then we moved it to a, a, an org um, called Open Zipkin in 2015 because the name Zipkin was already taken. I don't know why. Um, but uh, there tends to be Zipkins. I don't, you know, it makes Twitter searches harder, but not as hard as other things. Um, anyway, th there's, there's technology there. There's open API specs, Docker images, things like that. And since this is DevOps, I figured I would put an architecture slide because, hey, people tend to care. Um, this, is, this is pretty important to know. I, I said earlier that um, you know, this, is, this is in the observability tool space, but it's not a replacement for metrics or logging systems. And the real deal is, is that the, your actual applications um, are, I should have a laser pointer, but I don't, whatever. Um, these things report data to, to Zipkin, just like your apps would report metrics, um, just like they would report logging, right? So this is another type of information that they're exporting. And when we say instrumented, it's the things that are actually being timed directly with either plugins or agents or just library calls, depending on how people do it. And so usually these transports are like HTTP or, or Kafka or, or um, you know, some other mechanisms like Amazon SQS to get to Zipkin's system, which then collects this data um, and then shoves it into some storage. Like, you know, um, the most popular choices are Cassandra or Elasticsearch. Um, and then they're made for uh, query and analysis tools from there. And because tracing is new for a lot of folks, um, it's often good to like start with something like MySQL 
so for example, Zipkin's architecture is pluggable. If you're familiar with Docker, this is literally a Docker to compose file. It should actually work if you paste it. Um, and uh, we try to keep all of the things very simple. Uh, very little configuration is required. Um, so you just need to tell it what type of storage and, and you're, you're ready to go. Um, the, uh, you, you don't have to use Docker. We have Docker images. Uh, it can be as, as simple as a single file. Um, yeah, there's, other, there's other deployments. Uh, I know there's a Cal Cloud Foundry Bosch release. There's a Mesos framework. There's a um, Kubernetes thing. Um, but at the end of the day, um, this, is a, this is actually the server component is Java code, and, and it's a single jar file. So you, you can pretty much put that in anything, Puppet or whatever. So I, I didn't run too far out of time. So I think unless I've ran too fast for anyone to comp comprehend anything, we have time for a demo. Imagine that. So I'm going to use, um, who here have heard of, of Spring Boot? So Spring Boot is like a way to start apps. It's an alternative to like WAR files, um, which you would normally put you know, in, into a container of some sort. It's basically a, a file that you, uh, you would um, just Java minus jar to thing. And I have um, uh, a very quick demo, um, which will have like two apps talking to each other over HTTP, and we can, we can play with it that way. Now, um, in the Zipkin project, I have um, actually helped curate a bunch of examples um, in Go, and, and we, have, we have some Ruby stuff, and, and there's, there's Python. So just because I'm using Java doesn't necessarily, I don't want you to think that this is like Java-only technology. It just happens to be what I'm using for the demo. So I'm um, not a great uh, you know, front-end coder, um, but uh, this, is, this is my REST controller. I'm just taking a call called slash. And I'm hard coding in. <laughs> I'm not using discovery service because this is an example, right? And then I'm going to call a backend server that is going to print the date, right? So this, this should be simple. I've kept all of the examples as simple as this, just so that you can try it out, right? You don't have to get too fancy. Uh, the only thing that might surprise people is something I'm not going to explain too much, but cross origin requests. Uh, if you're in JavaScript world, you'll know why you have to do something like this. Um, but I'm going to uh, eventually use JavaScript that's not hosted on this server. So that's the only other thing. Uh, I didn't mention, but sampling is important in um, tracing. You don't necessarily want to sample 100% uh, of your request, because then you're just going to be storing a huge amount of data. Um, usually, you can get a good sense of, of your, um, uh, your application, like with 1 out of 10, or in Twitter's case, 1 out of 7 million requests. So. Um, Anyway, I'm going to start the servers. Um, I've named my application front end, so uh, this should show up as front end and this one back end. Of course, if I were using some of those Spring Cloud um, discovery integrations, I, I could use the you know, console or whatever to name these things. So I'm going to go ahead and start it. Here, start the back end, start the front end. And I'll start uh, Zipkin, Java minus jar. Zipkin.jar. OK, it starts. Uh, Zipkin has a built-in in-memory thing. Um, it's not production grade. Please don't use it for production. But it just lets you start without thinking. And so let's do this. Um, I'm going to go to view this beautiful app. And it still thinks I'm in Malaysia. And so I call it, and it prints out the time. So it's almost as fancy as like those hotel Wi-Fi uh, wi things, which say success. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to go to my local server. And of course, I could have used Docker to, to start Zipkin, uh, just doing it like this. So because I made some requests, uh, they start, you know, my service thing pops up here. And I can find uh, something interesting, right? Um, how many here have, have ever noticed like one request taking longer than another request? <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's like you know the first the first time penalty. If you you've hit a cold, anything, it, it always takes longer, right? So in this case, it's, it's an it's an order of magnitude longer. So if I look at it, I have five spans. In both cases, it hits the back end twice and the front end <laughs> three times. And, and this is just like operations, it's not necessarily network traffic. 
but one takes an order of magnitude longer. And so, um, you know, one thing to, to understand is like, of course, you can use your monitoring systems to figure out like what your norms should be, but um, this is, uh, you know, this is the 11 millisecond one, and this is the, the non. Now, when I, if I look at this data, I'll see that I start with a server receiving a request, and then uh, it's sending the response back. A lot of times, our, um, our observability systems start with the server because they don't have anything better. They can't actually uh, start collecting from the client's point of view, like from the Android app or the iOS app or the web browsers. Um, Zipkin has a, a project called Zipkin JS, and it's one of those polymorphic things which works on like Node and also browser. Um, so you can actually instrument your, um, your pages just like you would with Google Analytics or something like that to, to start traces there. And since, again, I'm a beautiful uh, web designer, I'll show you what my uh, web page looks like. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you can see that, but I'm just going to call some JavaScript because uh, that's about as far as I go. And this is, um, if I look at what the JavaScript's doing here, I'll uh, see client, well, it's beeping at me, I should mute. <laughs> um, Browser.js. So here I'm using a library called fetch, which is uh, basically an HTTP uh, client that works both in Node and in web browsers. And I'm going to do the same thing that I did directly here. Like, see, I just called 8081. Um, and then I'm going to use this like super fancy promise comprehension to just write the text back to the HTML because <laughs> it's cool, right? Um, so I'm going to do this. Uh, I've already done the command to like change the browse. Like uh, there's this command called browserify, which which you can use to compile um, a single file out of like npm stuff. And if you ever, if you're really curious about this, um, I can post notes later about these where these demo repositories are. Anyway, I'm going to open the index here, and wow, I'm seeing the time again. So I hit it three times. Now, if I go back to Zipkin, um, look at this. Browser is now a service <laughs> um, because I happened to name it that. And now instead of five, I see six, and I also see a slow one. So in this case, I see uh, of the commands that included browser, um, you know, one was slower than the others. Who might think they know why one was slower than the other? The server's warmed up. What, why is this one slower? Any guesses? Caching. caching is sort of, but we can tell with caching. So uh, let's, let's try to figure it out. So the first one. We see at, um, relatively speaking, 13 milliseconds into the request, it actually um, uh, calls, uh, calls a backend. This client send happened relatively one millisecond into the request, and then the server received it at 12 milliseconds. So now let's, let's look at the other one, um, one of the warmer ones. and. We look here, client send, the server received it a millisecond later. So um, the Zipkin JS library can actually be instrumented further to get into the network layer, but I think it's HTTP keep alive. So there's no, um, the browser will open up up to six connections per host, and the first one requires a new TCP socket, and in some cases a TLS connection. And so even on my laptop, that's going to take longer. Um, especially if you're long lining here to like some assets in the UK or something like that, you can see some pretty substantial uh, time spent in uh, network time that's not necessarily going to hit you the next. Now, this is just about understanding, right? So if you're looking at uh, tracing information, it's important to do this stuff because you can um, you know, more, you know, understand more what's going on. And like say, for example, um, oops. <laughs> uh, and I, I start calling it, and then I have done great error reporting, and I just do something like this, then I can also see what happens here. And so, whoops, I have four spans instead of six. <laughs> Oops. And uh, 
There's actually an error in the way that this was done, um, which is a, a bug on the server one because it's not turning this red. Um, it should have actually said that this was an error. Um, in some instrumentations, they do. And what if you actually, how many here have had somebody say, hey, let's just rewrite it in Node? Has that ever happened? I know at least it would happen with one person, right? So what if we did that? And I killed my Java server, and then instead I just run it in Node. <laughs> so what would happen to the same request? Well, first off, I didn't implement the back end in Node. Um, so it only tells me hello world. But I would be able to, to see the impact of doing that. And my newest request first. So here, um, I think this is what? Actually, I'm going to do this. To delete the other data. One thing that's nice is if you have a memory database, how do you delete data? Just restart your server. <laughs> boom, boom. OK. Yeah, here. So in this case, um, I got a 200 from my client. And that's about it. Uh, so thanks for uh, letting me do a demo. And again, I can get more stuff here. Um, it's it's fun and there's there's uh, lots of demos. If leave with nothing else, I would say um, if you want to start playing around with these tools, just uh, just use Zipkin server directly. Like maybe use uh, MySQL. Uh, don't get too fancy about streaming Kafka, etc. You can do that. There's plenty of people doing it, um, but it's it's like a new technology and it's nice to like learn one thing at a time. Um, and you're not alone. We have um, Gitter rooms. Uh, if you're interested in the spring side, we've got one for the spring tracing. If J Zipkin in general, which is which is polyglot, um, we have have a place uh, Gitters like Slack or HipChat or anything um, that you might use to communicate with people in real time. And uh, I think that's my last slide. So thanks. Any questions? Okay. Uh, I, I saw you first. So you have to look at them, um, each of the projects individually, to see which features they leverage. In some cases, they're just scheduling the execution of like Zipkin collectors and things. Um, and in some cases, the integration is higher. So I think, the, uh, for example, the Zipkin Kubernetes hooks up to some uh, monitoring tools, uh, like it's a bit more opinionated. Um, so, so yeah, I would, I would say that they, they kind of they have different features, depending on. And these are community-driven projects, so it, it kind of reflects what people are interested in. So in some cases, people are mo mostly interested in, in like the uh, scheduler aspect of it. Thanks. Sure. Yeah? Sure. Uh, the question was, what's the relationship between open Zipkin and open tracing? So um, I, I ran a workshop called Distributed Tracing Workgroup um, last year, which was like, across all the dif different tracing things, like what were some common problems. One of the problems was that these things that live inside the apps, these tracer libraries, um, oftentimes they're written uh, differently and by different people. They might look and feel um, different. So open tracing is like uh, sort of like how you might have a, a logger API that you have in your application. It's a way to standardize the programmatic API for that thing that's inside of your app. So for example, we have an open tracing Go um, library, and it uses the same um, library interface for those coding instrumentation, um, and then it plugs into Zipkin to send out the traces. But it could also plug into another system to send out traces. So, for example, if you if you had a commercial product, then you could you could use that uh, as an abstraction layer. Okay, other yeah. So the question is about overhead and, and Zipkin. So one of the things about the process is that uh, in Zipkin and most of the tracers, they, they split um, responsibility. There's a responsibility of like sending the information about what trace you're in, like by HTTP headers, 
and things like that. And then there's a responsibility of actually shipping the data to Zipkin, which is an as asynchronous process. Along the way, you have to time things and like uh, collect like IP addresses and stuff. So the overhead is going to depend on the tracer libraries and what language and, and, and things like that. And so generally speaking, people try to aim for like a 1% thing. But since it's, so, it's very, sub, it's very uh, hard to say, because there's like a few dozen different types of libraries and frameworks, uh, which ones have higher overhead than others. So what I would say is that the aim is, is usually the first priority is to not crash the app. Um, and to try not to have high overhead. And usually you will find in some of these tracer libraries someone pointing out something that they've noticed uh, is actually accidentally causing some latency, like this like dark latency, the one that's introduced by the tracing system. And so, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's going to vary. The frameworks, like these large frameworks like uh, gRPC and Finagle and stuff like that, they usually take like a lot more maniacal view towards overhead, and so so in some of those larger frameworks, their their tracers are very efficient. Uh, plenty of people use it in production. Uh, Twitter does, Uber does, uh, uh, they, Yelp, uh, they, like many many do do this in production. What's questioned about is what how much do they trace? So for example. Um, like I said, in, in Twitter, it, depending on this, the, the system, it might be as few as like one in seven million requests. Uh, in some cases, it's like one percent, and so um, it, that that varies quite a bit. But there's there would be dozens of of um, you know very earnest users um, that you'd recognize some of the names. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you.